Florida. During the late 1800s, while America was in the throes of the Industrial Revolution, most of Florida was this, jungle and swampland. One man, Henry Flagler, a partner in Standard Oil, saw the potential of this frontier as a land of endless summer. A vacation place for the rich, a place where common farmers could become wealthy landowners, and an opportunity for Henry Flagler to add to his fortune by developing a rail line to transport both guests and goods. One such settlement, Boca Raton, started as a small farming community, but with a combination of hard work, self-promotion, and a lot of luck, it became something more. Boca Raton. Today, it's a city of wealth and opportunity, worthy of its entrepreneurial beginnings. But it wasn't always that way. It was once just a mistake on a map. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, maps called the area Rio Seco, Dry River in Spanish. Originally, the name Boca Raton appeared further south, where the Raton River flowed into Biscayne Bay. But then, on a map from 1823, the Boca Raton label suddenly moved north to the area previously known as Rio Seco. In all probability, just a map maker's mistake. But the name stuck. When the pioneers began to arrive 70 years later, the name on the map became a settlement. Opportunists, self-promoters, the ambitious looking to become rich, and the con artists looking to make an easy buck. The railroad brought them all south. Flagler originally built his railroad to bring passengers to the new resorts on the Florida coast. Flagler at that point realized that with the investment he was making in extending the railroad, that it wasn't enough just to have people coming down to the resorts. He had to have full-time year-round freight and passenger revenue. The only way to do that was to encourage people to buy land for the purpose of starting farms. Because with farms comes produce. With farms comes product. With farms comes a need to move all of that material to market. And how do we move it to market? We move it by rail. Most of them, I think, were from, from the southeast, from Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee, that were farmers and they were looking for land to home. Their land was cheap. You're talking about a dollar and a half an acre and some of it even cheaper than that. Florida at that time was probably the last frontier. It was the last great patch of land in America that had not been explored and developed um, in terms of agriculture and in terms of buildings and uh, communities. And it must have taken someone who had courage, who was not afraid of something new, and who was keenly resourceful and had a great deal of self-esteem. They had to grub the land and, and get all the stumps out and the trees. And most of the farmers I've talked to was a big job. The, the pine trees, they would dig around them and they'd take dynamite and blow them out of the hole and then burn them right where they were if they could because they had no method of moving them, they were so big. To lay out the land for prospective farmers and other buyers, Henry Flagler hired Florida settler Thomas Rickards to survey and manage a land company. Around 1894, Rickards built Boca Raton's first house on a spot that would later be called Por Lamar, south of the Palmetto Park Road on the east side of the Intracoastal. Hard worker. Seemed to me that I don't know how he did the things he did in the short length of time he was here. As he sets out groves for Flagler and, and numerous other people. 
He was the mentor for the Japanese when they started the Yamato colony. Early Boca Raton from 1900 until 1920 was actually three separate settlements. The Yamato colony, or Japanese community, Pearl City, a settling place for the African-American farm workers, and the eight families that made up the town of Boca Raton. The Yamato colony was formed by Japanese Christians who left Buddhist Japan at a time of intense nationalism. To be Christian was to be un-Japanese. The Yamato colony in Florida offered an escape from discrimination. Coming to the first of these colonies uh, in, in Boca Raton uh, in 1903, 1904 must have been rather strange uh, for these people. Uh, particularly since uh, most of them probably uh, were not actual agricultural workers. They may have, you know, owned farms and this type of thing, but they seem to have been very middle class, not, not uh, farm workers. Uh, but they came. I, I think they were viewed as hardworking, good people. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I don't think Florida has ever turned down anyone when it gets down to it. Uh, the colony had a great deal of success uh, and was doing quite well uh, growing pineapples. It was a matter of, of protecting the plants from wildlife, uh, insect life, and then the sand itself. Uh, and uh, this was hard work and the pineapples were prickly, uh, the plants, and so you had to wear lots of clothing and uh, cover yourself uh, from both uh, the prickly plants and the mosquitoes uh, and in hot weather that was probably even more miserable uh, but uh, in the beginning at least the the profits were very very good and people were willing to do it but then there was a pineapple blight uh, which seems to have been a disaster for the entire industry in South Florida cheaper pineapples from Cuba eventually took over the market and even though the colony itself ended, individual Japanese stayed and farmed until the beginning of the Second World War, when the land became the Army Air Base. Meanwhile, other settlers were experimenting with citrus groves and other crops. Frank Cheesebro was typical. An educated horticulturalist and avid reader, Cheesebro set out to develop a large pineapple plantation and vegetable farm. Now he's had the trip on the train from Michigan, stops, spends the night in West Palm, buys the horse and wagon, and he's out plowing fields two hours after he arrives in town. Cheesebro went on to help build Boca Raton's first public school. And to transport his produce, he constructed a packing house near the rail line. With Boca Raton's plantations in full swing, there was more work than people. By 1915, the farms in Boca Raton were prosperous enough to support the town's African-American community, Pearl City. Local resident and Harvard graduate George Long surveyed and plotted the area. Complete with churches and a school, Pearl City was a place where families could grow and prosper. One colored fellow came in and built, then the next one come there, and this was where they, they had stopped building, and everybody was like sisters and brothers. I mean, if you had peas, I had peas. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, we were all like sisters and brothers. It was great. It was great. No fussing, no fighting. We helped each other. After World War I, America was on a roll. Boca Raton was no exception. A land boom was getting underway. One commentator said that Florida was sort of uh, the romance of Spain and the Caribbean, but with American plumbing. And some people were buying stuff without the land without even looking at it. Swamps and places with no access to get to it, you know. They just went crazy. And the people in town, they started putting on shirts you know, and slicking back the hair and <laughs> putting on shoes. <laughs> Imogene Gates's father, 
Harley Gates, moved to Boca Raton to sell real estate. Others joined him, including J.C. Mitchell, who later became mayor, and a talented architect at the height of his career, Addison Meisner. My feeling is that uh, Meisner, who came from a California family that was, you know, reasonably well-to-do, but not rich, uh, found himself living in Palm Beach and being the architect and, and friend and, and so on for people who were terribly rich and who decided he'd like to be rich. And Boca Raton was really uh, his way uh, of making his fortune. Miser was a social architect. He went out every single night. He had dinner parties. He went to dinner parties. He was very amusing. People wanted to have him around, and that's basically how he was able to sell his product, which was the Mediterranean Revival style. He was able to talk about it. He was able to make people laugh about it. He was able to make people want it. He put sales offices in Miami and Washington, and prominent cities all up north. He had factories in West Palm Beach. They were known as Meisner Industries. Doors were done that way, even window frames. Meisner's contribution to Boca Raton was to lay out plats for the entire town, essentially planning the town's growth. His contribution to the rest of South Florida was just as profound. Almost single-handedly, he changed the architecture of the region from this to this. So his houses usually had coconut palms surrounding them uh, because they, they added to that sort of uh, romantic picture that he was trying to come up with. Uh, he also used decorative details that were Spanish or Mediterranean, uh, door surrounds and window surrounds with columns and that type of thing. Meisner opens the whole house up uh, and consequently living rooms really just sort of expand into porches or into patios and dining rooms and, and other rooms do the same thing and he uses lots of balconies on the second floor so that you can really open up bedrooms and that type of thing. Meisner designed and built residential developments and public buildings. He basically platted out the entire town with the Cloister Inn as its center. He built the Cloister Inn to lure potential real estate investors. When it opened in 1926, the luxury hotel was the most expensive 100-room hotel ever built. Both the Cloister Inn and the Meisner Empire looked spectacular. But the financial foundation on which it was all built had already begun to crumble. Within a year, Meisner's world came crashing down. Almost everybody becomes involved in the land boom. If they're not selling lots, uh, they're in construction, uh, and the money to be made on things like this is, is just great. Uh, and no one is around that wants to really do the dirty work, like unloading railroad cars. With hundreds of loaded cars choking South Florida's rail yards, the railroads began to refuse to transport building materials into the state. First of all, there were, there were no trucks coming down because the roads were so terrible at the time. The, the, the ships could not get into the Miami Harbor because the, uh, the schooner, the four-masted schooner, had turned over at the mouth of the Miami Harbor, blocking the harbor. So you had only the railroad, and now the railroad was embargoed. And so indeed what we had was a sudden dearth of building materials, equipment, supplies, and this really put a tremendous damper on construction. Meanwhile, Florida received some unwelcome publicity. Uh, the good, you know, middle class person who uh, took their vacations in the summer and not in the winter uh, and brought their kids along and, you know, came in the Tin Lizzie or what have you, uh, decided in the summer of 1925 to come and see what Florida was all about. Well, in 1925, you didn't come to Florida in the summer. Uh, they got here and they discovered that most of the hotels were closed. It was seasonal. People didn't have air conditioning. You didn't open hotels. Restaurants were closed. 
Even shops and, and stores were closed, grocery stores. Uh, so that people arrived and found that there was no place to stay but tent cities and mosquitoes and that type of thing. And these people went back north and said, you know, anyone would be absolutely crazy to invest money in Florida. Uh, this is at the same time when bankers in the north are saying, why is all this money going to Florida? Meisner was caught in the middle of it all. Part of his problems, he overextended himself. He, he was in this, this businessman's mode, and he needed cut stone. So he bought a quarry in the Keys to quarry coquina, and he had to buy very expensive pieces of machinery to cut the stone, and he basically lost his shirt on that investment. And he died, he died a broken man. He died with very little money in 1933. And uh, during the boom, you know, they, everybody made a lot of money and everybody went broke, too, in, during the boom, 25. And everything just dropped. Buildings were left empty, half built. It was really depressing. Dad lost everything. All he had was land. Well, the, the bust has taken place. Uh, and poor Boca Raton is not in great shape. Uh, I mean, you know, all of a sudden, uh, the city of Boca Raton ha has uh, gone out and, and bought uh, a fire engine that they can't afford to pay for now. They built a new town hall that they can't afford to pay for. And, and so uh, they get the idea that publicity would be a good idea. Uh, and so Mitchell, uh, one of the early real estate men, uh, and He's going to be mayor for years in Boca and so on, persuades the Chamber of Commerce to build this gigantic wooden uh, camel across Dixie Highway. Shriners on their way to a convention in Miami would be forced to drive under the camel and, at least in theory, would then carry the name of Little Boca Raton far and wide. Apparently it worked, because when the Elks held their convention, the camel lost its hump, and tree limbs were added for antlers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't think it looks much like an elk. <laughs> what they may not have realized was their little town had already caught the attention of someone who would change Boca Raton forever. By 1928, with Boca Raton fallen on hard times, Meisner's dream was bankrupt and up for sale. It was bought by a man named Clarence Geist. Geist made his money up north in the utilities industry. He used that money to transform the Cloister Inn into a dream of his own. He had for a number of years said that he was very interested uh, in establishing a club in South Florida that would be very similar to his club in New Jersey. On, on the coast, uh, a summer club in New Jersey and a winter club for members in the South. Boca Raton welcomed Geist and his guests with open arms. But they really got excited when the Geist came. They would put on their shirts, slick up their hair and ties and go to meet the train, you know, hoping because they wanted jobs, you know, this was different. They could have work now. Everybody depended on the hotel for those days. It was only three months. You had to make it in three months or you didn't make it. <laughs> you know. It was said that under Geist in uh, the years of the 30s, it was one of the most uh, private clubs uh, in, in the country. The people would pass down US-1 and see the towers in the distance, uh, but have no idea what was there uh, and that no one uh, ever got into the club that was not invited by uh, a member or a guest. And if you read the newspaper articles from the 30s, it was one of the most exclusive clubs in the world and was an international destination. People came from Europe to go to the Boca Raton Club. The Duke of Windsor played golf there with Fred Perry, the great tennis great. You had to be a wealthy man. You had to be a millionaire to belong there, in other words, back in those days. Geist himself was not afraid to use the power of his wealth and his connections to get what he wanted. 
When his guests needed a new airport, he arranged for one. He was not only able to get the city to agree, uh, but he actually was able to get the WPA uh, to agree to, to put money and, and workers into the project. And uh, within a few months, Boca Raton had an airport. When Boca Raton needed a better water supply, he arranged for that too. We had the best water in the state for I don't know how many years. And it was through him that, uh, that they had that water plant. He wanted to have moved the elections to February when his workers were here so he could control uh, and have a big say in what was done for the area. Well, he complained about they need more workers and we need to try to, Boca Raton wasn't growing fast enough. He said uh, when he came back in the fall, he'd like to see a lot of babies in the women's arms. And, and sure enough, there were five, my mother was one of them, uh, ladies that had their little babies. I think I was six weeks old at the time when Mr. Guy's railroad car rolled in in January of 1932. And apparently he was pretty pleased about that whole deal. That was the kind of, that was expressive of the kind of fellow that Clarence Geist was. He maximized all his leverage, probably had to because he was not the kind of person that people would just ordinarily do things for because they liked him. He was not a likable fellow as far as I could tell from what I learned. And you know, people would look at the rich folks that came down to the hotel. It wasn't the hotel then, it was the club. And, uh, and, and it was much more of a them and us mentality. The folks that would come down to the hotel, um, uh, even during the Depression times, um, you know, the rich people do it differently. Compared to the club's wealthy guests, life was different for the average resident of Boca Raton. People were still selling and developing real estate. One man, August Butts, bought land out west and began farming. My mom was a great worker. Matter, matter of fact, my dad worked, but he did his own farming. And my mom used to tell him all the time, you put everything you get in the ground and you never profit. So we walked from here to Butts Farm to work. Seven days a week most times, okay? That's what we did, we picked beans. Now that was the biggest thing beans, you know, the truck would come and get you, and we went all around to the farm picking beans. I love to pick beans. I love to pick beans. And I had, once I could pick like 12, 18 half of the beans a day. The truck come along and the boys on the back of the truck throw the beans up, the hampers up, one catch them, stack them, and they take them to the seaboard. They had a station out there, they take them there, they load them, and I don't know what time of night, but the freight train takes them away. But crops were the only things heading north. The residents of Boca Raton lived here year-round. Although the winters were beautiful, the summers could be brutal. If it wasn't the heat, it was the bugs. Oh man, they, they, you don't want to be, you don't want to buy, you don't want to live on the ocean. Not in those days. My dad could have bought uh, all the property he wanted on A1A for five dollars an acre but he didn't have the money to pay the 50 cent tax on, you know. But they, they, you, don't, you didn't want to live on the other side of the canal. There was too many sand gnats. And sand flies, they got through the screens. You couldn't get rid of them. All kinds of things, scorpions, roaches, snakes. They'd come into your house. You couldn't close the windows, it's too hot but you close the, put the kerosene on the rag and wipe the screen so that to keep them sand nets out. Uh, they, they come through a screen, they were so tiny. <sighs> when night come, you better have your little pot somewhere to make you a smudge if you're gonna be outside to keep away the mosquitoes. But living in Boca Raton wasn't all heat and insects. It was wonderful when I was young, you know, and I ran free on the plantation there and all over town. You'd go into anyone's house, there was always biscuits and what do they call it, side meat they called it. We'd go swimming in the canal, would put on a father's old shirt or something to keep him getting sunburned. And we'd go to the beach, play all day there on the beach. Oh, we used to take a seine around the lake here and 
seen out buckets, take five gallon buckets of, we call them shiners and filters and menhaden minnows and we'd pack them in ice and go out there on the end of the jetty with a cane pole and all night long you'd catch snappers that weighed two and three pounds. And some of them would be so big they jerk the line right out of your hand. But I've seen mackerel and uh, bluefish so thick but you never see that anymore and I guess because of pollution and overfishing. While the local children played, the club's guests came and went year after year. What no one realized was that neither Geist's club nor his land company ever made any money. He'd been subsidizing his Boca Raton operations all along. So his death in 1938 could have been a disaster for the town, but it wasn't. Geist created a trust to ensure that the Geist era's good times would continue for a while. Oh, I stayed in Deerfield Beach with my sister one time, and we waked up. He'd wake up during the night, and you'd hear those torpedoes going off. And we'd get up and go down on the beach the next morning, and you'd see the halves of the ship, some of them burning out there in the ocean. J.C. Mitchell, a real estate agent during the land boom and now mayor of Boca Raton, saw an opportunity. So he traveled to Washington, D.C. to make a pitch for his town. The reason the air base was established was to be the radar training station uh, for the Air Force. Uh, and it was the only radar training station for the Air Force in the country. And Boca Raton seemed to be particularly good for, well, one, uh, more actual days of good flying weather than any other place in the country. Uh, and secondly, because of the shipping lanes uh, on, on the ocean. Uh, and as the ships went up and down the east coast of Florida, uh, they could be tracked by the radar and thus train people uh, in, in using the radar equipment. In case it was ever bombed from the air, the air base in Boca Raton was built according to the dispersed base arrangement, which was designed to confuse the enemy. So you have lots of corkscrew streets and buildings at odd angles uh, and housing at odd angles so that it would be very difficult. Imagine flying along 500 miles an hour and uh, people are shooting at you from all directions and you're trying to locate a single facility that you're trying to bomb. It would be very difficult. The hotel was Boca Raton for so many years. All of a sudden, the air base is Boca Raton. Uh, and it's not just an impact. It completely overwhelms the town. Uh, the town can't really support the air base. We were all amazed at all these um, men coming in and um, the airplanes and all that stuff. We've seen them but not in such great force. People would go to the beach, I mean on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, the beach would have literally thousands of guys down there. The club was taken over uh, by the Air Force to house officers uh, and they're wonderful stories about uh, the people working at the club uh, having to try to store the antiques and the oriental rugs and, and the uh, sculpture and so on uh, and uh, where they couldn't store it because it was attached or something, putting padding around it uh, so it wouldn't be destroyed by the officers. I sold papers there for, uh, for the whole time that the military occupied the hotel. I remember one time I had on a pair of fatigue pants. I had those great big pockets, and uh, I would sell like three or four hundred papers um, in a in a day as the guys were would come out of the mess hall and that type of thing. And and uh, I had both pockets just loaded with change, and I had these big high top brogans on. And I remember I fell off the dock right at the hotel, right out right outside the uh, uh, where the patio is, and uh, I I couldn't get up. They had to, a, a a soldier jumped in and uh, pulled me out of the water. The newspaper boy survived. The hotel survived. But the air base didn't. Soon after the war, the base shut down. Well, Boca asked to buy back the whole thing. Uh, and they won. Uh, and for what is just around a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, but with the idea uh, that the uh, airport would be maintained for civilian 
uh, aeronautics from this time on. Uh, and basically they were able to do it because they had already sort of made some contacts and they knew they could sell off parts of it, which they did very quickly. It was sold off in every conceivable form. Somebody would buy acreage, somebody would buy a, a building, some guys would buy um, acreage and buildings and so forth. A lot of the temporary buildings were, um, were, were torn down and the land was sold as vacant. So they had some large buildings and it was right on 4th Avenue, not too far from the main gate. And they didn't know what to do with those buildings. And here Mr. Eshelman came and he said, I'd like to buy those buildings. Well, it was like manna from heaven to, to Joe Moore to, to sell those things. But Ira Eshelman was a bright minister and recognized the value of the real estate here and recognized how wonderful it was in the winter and felt he could preach his message in a warmer climate to more people. They came and they started a winter Bible conference there. Uh, which brought a lot of people uh, there to, they built a couple of little motel units which are still there. Bible Town has been enormously successful over the years and has brought some wonderful people to this town. And uh, a lot of those people ended up retiring here. Other entrepreneurs also saw opportunity in Boca Raton. African USA was probably the earliest safari uh, uh, in Florida. It was sort of a wildlife refuge in which people rode little motorized trains uh, that were really on wheels and, and not on tracks and saw these animals. And obviously the animals couldn't be terribly ferocious because <laughs> there was no protection. You just rode through. Uh, but there was an African village, and there was African waterfalls, uh, and the animals. Uh, and it was basically where Camino Gardens housing development is today. There was a double wire fence around uh, the outside, around the perimeter. And uh, uh, the only meat eaters were the two cheetahs. All the rest were, were uh, zebras, antelope. Uh, there were uh, camels and giraffes, and, and, and uh, there, were, there were a couple of uh, elephants. Africa, USA was a popular attraction, but when a disease-bearing tick was discovered on the imported animals, the park was shut down to protect Florida's cattle industry. Boca Raton was also home to another theme park. Ancient America was an <laughs> uh, Indian theme park, I suppose you would almost say. Uh, it, it was on North Federal Highway, basically where the sanctuary is today. Uh, and there were some Indian mounds there. And uh, it was one of these tourist attractions uh, that uh, you had Indian artifacts and you could actually walk through a tunnel uh, and the tunnel had glass walls and you could see some of the burials and so on. Uh, and the owner later said uh, that unfortunately Florida tourists weren't interested in culture. They just wanted to get to the horse and the dog tracks. Meanwhile, Geist's exclusive Boca Raton Club had been sold to J. Meyer Schein, who renovated it and reopened it as a hotel. The end result was much of the Meisner furniture uh, was uh, sold. Uh, in fact, uh, there are people who later told us that up and down the East Coast, uh, they went into antique stores uh, and found them gutted uh, with Meisner industry furniture uh, that no one seemed to want at the time. Uh, many of the, the really interesting details were painted out. One of the things that happened so often in this period was that everybody thought white paint, uh, you know, covered up everything and looked modern and different. Uh, the rooms were refurnished. Uh, and uh, in general, much of the character of the old hotel uh, was gone. Uh, and without uh, its setting on Lake Boca Raton and the golf courses and everything, uh, the hotel could have been just about any place in the world. For most of its existence, Boca Raton had been a modest farming town surrounding a wealthy and exclusive enclave at the club. That began to change in the late 1950s. My father was kind of the author of uh, the strict zoning code that we had in the city. 
you know, there was, there was a sense in which when you stepped out of Boca Raton, you stepped down. One person who noticed was Arthur Vining Davis, founder of Alcoa and a wealthy industrialist. He was in his 80s and obviously just literally could not retire. He's out of the company. He starts buying land in the Bahamas. He starts buying land in South Florida. And ultimately, he bought the hotel from the Shines and becomes, you know, the land baron in his 80s and early 90s of South Florida. He envisioned uh, the expansion and development of, uh, uh, of the hotel. It was a great hotel. It was, not a, uh, it was not a convention hotel at that time. It was strictly a, a social hotel, and it closed in the summertime completely. To realize his vision for Boca Raton, Davis needed money. He was wealthy on paper, but various stock arrangements left him short on cash. So he formed a new corporation, Arvida, taken from his full name, Arthur Vining Davis. Davis signed the contracts in New York and had the money he needed. We were coming back on the airplane from New York with uh, having acquired the $27.5 million and we were all the way back, we were singing, we've got a barrel of money. <laughs> with the cash and our Vita Corporation, Davis set about transforming not just the club he'd bought, but the entire city of Boca Raton into what the Miami Herald later called the rich man's playground. Arvida developed the Royal Palm Yacht and Country Club and Boca West. These upscale developments evolved into the gated communities we see throughout the city. But his most distinguishing mark was the addition of the tower to the Boca Raton Hotel. Constructed after his death, the tower gave them the rooms necessary to support the convention centers and additional amenities. What you talk about in the, in the late 50s was just a normal growth, uh, and it, there was no concerted effort. When Arvida came, Arvida kind of pulled together and led the growth for probably 25 years. He had good people around him. His secretary, Evelyn Mitchell, was uh, a lady that was more than just a secretary. She made a lot of his decisions for him and helped him to make others. Uh, uh, because he was really quite old and, and to some degree feeble, although not feeble-minded. The guy was sharp as a tack uh, and was a quality fellow uh, and a visionary. He knew that what he was doing would be here long after he was gone. Other visionaries were also at work in Boca Raton. The tragic poisoning of two small children who died while being rushed to distant hospitals prompted a group of citizens to raise funds for a hospital of Boca's own. The fact that this organization was able to raise the money so quickly seemed to be just another example of Boca Raton growing into a stable year-round city. Meanwhile, local farmer and banker Tom Fleming was looking ahead to the town's need for an institution of higher education. His son remembers. He did see that research and development industry as being uh, a clean industry, a high economic industry, that is, it's uh, attracting jobs that are middle and upper middle income and level paying jobs without producing all of the uh, uh, undesirable offshoot of smoke and s soot and smog and so on and so forth. And he, could, he, he was very strong on the sense that with a good solid higher education system in the state of Florida, Florida stood to uh, realize the benefits of that research and development and technology field. Florida Atlantic University was the result. After overcoming an initial lack of students, it opened in the fall of 1964. The story, of course, is that, that President Kennedy had agreed to come to the dedication. Uh, he had been assassinated, obviously, uh, and uh, Johnson was the substitute. There were 15,000 people uh, come to see Johnson do this and he was very late and everybody was wondering about it and then it was discovered that the presidential limousine came up on the turnpike and it had a flat tire and no one had heard of the presidential limousine having a flat tire uh, and then during the waiting period airplanes kept flying over uh, with banners for Goldwater for president 
because uh, this is right in the middle of the presidential campaign. Uh, and then helicopters from the Army <laughs> would come by and chase these planes away. Uh, and at the same time, we also noticed that there were snipers on top of the library and the other buildings, uh, you know, because this is so soon after the assassination and everybody's worried about President Johnson and, uh, and his safety. <laughs> Boca Raton now added up to everything a large company was looking for. A university with an interest in R&D, good schools, luxury housing, a hospital, and a thriving economy. So in 1967, IBM brought a new manufacturing facility to town, and eventually other companies followed. It was here, 13 years later, that a mysterious project got underway at IBM. It was headed up by a man called Philip Don Estridge. And the most interesting thing about Don Estridge was he could never tell you what he did. He used to say, well, Don, we know you work for IBM. What do you do? He could never tell us because he was the head of the team that was working on the creation of the personal computer on the PC that has changed life all over the world. Estridge's maverick team of engineers took the IBM personal computer from drawing table to finished product in less than a year. Everything went wrong, constantly. Um, it was just one, you know, one fire after another, one battle after another. It was not an easy thing to do. And, you know, there were, there were times when it was, we had serious doubt that we could get the product down. It was an unheard of accomplishment, especially in a company that typically took four to six years to develop a product. There was an internal battle between the PC development group, or the whole PC group, and the existing um, structure. So we really um, kind of tore up the old way of doing business. The estimated uh, sales figure with 315,000 units and I think we hit and that was for the for the product period for the whole run and I think we hit a million in just a short period of time so manufacturing was probably running 24 hours a day and they had to retool and retool because the demand kept growing and growing and growing and that that was the that was the amazing period and it will forever mark Boca Raton in, in world history as the spot where the PC was, was created. Throughout the 70s and 80s, IBM attracted a whole new array of high-tech industries before moving to North Carolina. In the late 80s, roads and development continued to expand the borders of Boca Raton, shifting what was considered to be the center of town west with the construction of the Town Center Mall. Seeing this change, in the early 70s, a group of residents realized Boca Raton's heritage was on the verge of being lost to urban sprawl. They founded the Boca Raton Historical Society to find ways to preserve the city's past. Through partnerships with the city and state and generous donations from local businesses, they started the first of many restoration projects with the preservation of Old Town Hall. With a home and a firm commitment from the community, the society continued its campaign to restore downtown. Over time, the Boca Raton Historical Society has worked with the city to reconstruct Sanborn Square, Singing Pines, and the train station, originally built by Clarence Geist. Their vision was simple. Preserve the city's past, and in turn, preserve its historical character and soul. Their legacy is for the children of tomorrow to hear the voices of Boca Raton's past through their accomplishments and architectural treasures. From its headquarters in Old Town Hall, the Boca Raton Historical Society continues to create opportunities for Boca Raton's future while preserving its past. <laughs>